This video is going to be an attempt to visually explain the second derivative test and analyze why it works so nicely the way it does. Before we do that, let's just have a quick refresher of the first derivative. If you track the values of the slope and put them onto another function, that's what we call the derivative. And this is why we have stationary points when the derivative function is equal to zero. Cool, let's do this with an explicit example. Let's say we've got a cubic, we differentiate it, we get a quadratic. And we know that those y values on the quadratic will tell us the slope values on the cubic. And we could take another derivative, which would in turn tell us the same thing for the quadratic function. What I'm interested in is the relationship between the original function and the second derivative. And if you watch closely, you might be able to see something interesting happen when the second derivative is equal to zero. Here, I'll rewind it and let's take a closer look at what happens in the neighborhood of x equals one. What I want you to notice is that the slope is always decreasing until it hits that point x equals one. And at this point, we can see that the second derivative is equal to zero and that it splits the cubic up into a happy and sad quadratic. Moving along from this point, we'll notice that the slope is then constantly increasing. In calculus terms, we call this a concavity. And when the second derivative is equal to zero, we call that the point of inflection. And it's this point of inflection that separates the concavity of a function. Not all points of inflection separate the concavity, like a cubic function. Sometimes we have a horizontal point of inflection, but more on that later. Moving on to the second derivative test, it tells us that if x equals a is a stationary point, then using the second derivative, if you put that stationary point into the second derivative and it's negative, you get a maximum. If it's positive, you get a minimum. And if it's equal to zero, then the results are inconclusive. I wanna try and visually explain why the second derivative will tell us the nature of stationary points. At x equals negative one, we should see that the slope is constantly decreasing, which implies that we've got downward concavity. The second derivative is negative, so this implies that the slope was constantly decreasing. Therefore, we would have to have a maximum at that point. Let's slide on down to the point of x equals three. Same logic, we can see that the slope is now constantly increasing after that point of inflection. The second derivative is positive, so it should only make sense that we've got a minimum at this point. The slope was constantly increasing, so it was negative, then flat, then positive, within that small neighborhood of x. To really reinforce this point, the second derivative test utilizes concavity. The point of inflection is found by using the second derivative, and at that point, that'll split concave up and concave down of a function. If the function is concave down, you've got a max, and the second derivative is negative. And if the function is concave up, you've got a minimum, and the second derivative is positive. So moving into an example, we've got here, determine the nature of all stationary points for this function. Oh, well, that's easy. We'll differentiate it, set equal to zero to get the stationary points, and then we'll use the second derivative to determine the nature. So just a quick recap on that. We've got, uh, we find a derivative, we let it equal zero, and then we find out that x equals a negative a half is our only a valid stationary point, because this, even though we said it's equal to zero, so we use null factor law, like that equals zero, uh, or that equals zero, because they're multiplied together, uh, this one is gonna have no solutions, because for e to the power of two x has to be positive, it can't be zero. Uh, now, we're gonna use the second derivative. And I really just want to emphasize on the importance of factorizing your derivative, because when you go to take a second derivative, it's so much easier to do when it's factorized. So we get the second derivative, we found that. Now, uh, by using the second derivative test, I'm going to substitute this value. Let me, let me go around my green. I'm going to substitute this value into this function. If it's positive, I get a minimum. If it's negative, I get a maximum. So I'm just using the second derivative to determine the nature, okay? Utilizing the concavity. Okay, so I'm going to sub x equals negative a half because that's my stationary point found by the first derivative into the second derivative, which will tell me the nature. 
So when we get to this point, I notice that this is going to be a positive number and this is going to be a positive number. So I don't really care what value it is, I just care about the sign of it. I know it's going to be positive, uh, therefore x equals negative a half is a max, no minimum, minimum, sorry, minimum. Because uh, if we've got if we've got positive uh, as a second derivative, that means we're going to have upward concavity. Uh, so that would imply that we've got a minimum, right? It's, we've got upward concavity. So like the cave is the cave is going up, or it's like a skate ramp. I don't know. Uh, and then uh, graphically, let's have a look at this graphically. All right, here's our graph. Here's our stationary point at negative a half. On the function here, the purple one is the function. We can see that, and I've got here, this is my first derivative, okay? When the first derivative was equal to zero at that x point, that's x equals negative a half, that determined the stationary point, so that implies that the slope is flat. But then utilizing the second derivative right here, okay, that's telling me, well, the second derivative is going to be very, very, very uh, positive because it's up there, right? But that's telling me that. Well, for example, at this point, at x equals negative 1, uh, the second derivative was equal to 0. So if I map that down here, okay, that implies that uh, we had a point of inflection there. So like it was negative slope, and then it got super negative, but then it got, well, not super negative, but it was the most negative that the, the function was going to be. And then it got a little less negative, and the slope, although it was negative, started to then increase from that point up. And that's what this concavity, this positive concavity is telling us. Okay, it's telling us after this point of inflection, okay, so now we're at, we've moved along, we're at x equals a half. The second derivative is positive, And so that is telling me that uh, what was happening to the slope is that it was increasing. Okay, I don't know the value of it, but it was increasing. So that means that... Um, and if I had a stationary point in the process there and it was constantly increasing, then after the point of zero, it would have gone up. So let's say one. And then before the point of zero, if it was if it was increasing to get to zero, it must have been like negative one. So that's, I mean, hopefully that kind of makes a bit of sense. Now in this example here, we're asked to determine the intervals for which the function, uh, this one here, is a concave up or concave down. What we need to do is we need to determine the point of inflection because that separates concave up and concave down. Uh, and we'll just need to verify that that point of inflection is not a horizontal point of inflection or any other weird point that might pop out. Okay, so we've got some verification that we might do. Okay, so here I can see I've got my point of inflection at x equals uh, negative 4 on 3, at least I think I do. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to verify that this is a point of inflection. Because like if you imagine, if you imagine you've got some curve and you suggest that this is the point of inflection, well if it, if it truly is, if it truly is the point of inflection, we should have this part should be concave down and this section here, now let me do this in another color, this color here, should be concave up. So if we look in the small, if we zoom into, and I'll actually zoom in here, if we go into a small neighborhood, if this is the point, if this point here is x equals negative four on three, then what we should have uh, over just to the left of it, so let's say it, uh, x equals negative two, and x equals negative one, let's say, uh, what we should have at x equals negative 1, if we sub it into the second derivative, uh, we should have positive concavity. And if we sub x equals negative 2 into the second derivative, we should have negative concavity or concave down. Uh, so we're just going to verify that with what we call a concavity table. Okay, so we've got the point negative four on three, and we know that is our point of inflection. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna put a zero there to indicate it's got it's got neither concave up or concave down. I'm gonna pick the point negative two and negative one. Now to determine concavity, I need to sub them into the second derivative. Here we've got a concave up. And if we look here on a graph, uh, x equals negative four on three. That's this point here. So that was our point of inflection, and we use the second derivative test at x equals negative 1, so small neighborhood. We could see at least the concavity at that point was concave 
like so. And uh, before that, uh, so at x equals negative 2, we had concave down. Concave down. So now we've just got to finish answering this question. Okay. Uh, the question asks, determine the intervals. So I would say, I would say it's concave down from negative infinity through tool x through tool negative 4 on 3 not inclusive because at the point x equals negative 4 on 3 it's neither concave up or concave down and then just to finish it off concave up from negative 4 on 3 not including x and we don't include infinity 